This is a revision video about the GCSE chemistry topic of the properties of ionic compounds. This comes up in the structure and bonding topic in paper one of AQA GCSE chemistry and combined science. By the end of this video, you should be able to identify substances that contain ionic bonds, describe the properties of ionic substances, describe the structure of those ionic substances, identify some disadvantages with the models we use for drawing or representing ionic bonding, and also use that structural information to explain why ionic compounds have the properties that they do. As we saw in the previous video, ionic bonds form between metallic and non-metallic elements. The metallic elements are going to be found on the left-hand side of the periodic table, and for GCSE chemistry, we're just going to look at the ones in group one and group two and the transition metals. And then the non-metallic elements we're going to be interested in tend to be those in group six and group seven. Based on those parameters and maybe using a periodic table to help you, can you look at this list of substances and identify which of them contain ionic bonds? Pause the video now and write down some answers. So looking down this list, carbon and hydrogen are both non-metals, so methane is not going to contain ionic bonds. Likewise, hydrogen and oxygen, both non-metals, so water does not contain ionic bonds. Sodium, on the other hand, is a metal in group one. And when it bonds with chlorine, which is a non-metal from group seven, it does form ionic bonds. Likewise, potassium is another group one metal. So potassium chloride also contains ionic bonds. Chlorine atoms are all non-metals, so that's not going to be one of these. Um, but magnesium is a metal bonding with oxygen as a non-metal, which is also ionic. Nitrogen is another non-metal, sulphur is a non, another non-metal, and then iron oxide is going to contain both iron atoms, which is obviously a metal, and oxygen atoms, which are a non-metal. So again, we've got ionic bonding. And then finally, methanol only contains non-metals, so that is not ionic. When we look at examples of ionic compounds like table salt or like the copper sulfate crystals that you might have made as part of the unit four required practical, if you've done that unit already, they tend to be solids at room temperature. And the reason that they're solids is that their melting points are generally very, very high. Ionic substances don't conduct electricity when they're solid. So if you made up a circuit and you filled a gap in that circuit with salt, it would not conduct electricity. However, if you melt that salt, or if you dissolve it, then it will conduct electricity. To make sure that made sense, pause the video here and try to write down which ones of these substances you think are ionic compounds. Remember, an ionic compound will be a solid at room temperature that doesn't conduct electricity when it's solid, but does when it's a liquid or when it's been dissolved. The first substance in this table has a melting point of zero and a boiling point of 100. So at room temperature, about 20 degrees C, it's going to be a liquid, and therefore it's clearly not an ionic substance. B looks slightly more promising because it does have a very high melting point and boiling point. But when it's a solid, it already conducts. So this is probably a metal. It's certainly not an ionic substance. Substance C also has a high melting and boiling point, and it doesn't conduct electricity when it's a solid, but it does when it's a liquid. So this one is an ionic substance. Substance D also has quite a high melting point and boiling point, doesn't conduct as a solid, and does as a liquid. So again, this is an ionic substance. Substance E has a very high melting point and boiling point, but it doesn't conduct even when it's been melted. This is probably diamond, and it's definitely not an ionic substance. Finally, substance F has a nice high melting point and boiling point. It doesn't conduct as a solid, and it does as a liquid. So we have a third ionic compound in our table. In order to understand why it is that ionic compounds have these properties, we need to know what their structure looks like. When you have a covalently bonded substance, it might only have two or three or seven atoms in it. But an ionic substance is always a giant structure. We call this a giant ionic lattice. And what it means is that there are going to be thousands or even millions of ions. These positive and negatively charged ions are going to be mixed together in a constant ratio. So what that means is that there might always be one positive for one negative, or there might be 
two positive for one negative, but the ratio is always going to be the same in all the parts of that lattice. Because we have a positively charged object and a negatively charged object, they're going to be attracted together by what we call an electrostatic force. This is the same force that you'll have met in physics where you studied static electricity. This electrostatic force is really strong and it acts in all directions between the positive and the negative ions. Because it's such a strong force, it takes a huge amount of energy to overcome it. And this is what's going to hold the lattice together, even at very high temperatures. To represent the structure of this giant ionic lattice, we could also represent it like this picture on the right. Now, one disadvantage of both of these styles of model is that they're not really showing that this is a giant structure. We know that a giant ionic lattice will contain thousands or even millions of ions, and these diagrams don't really show that very clearly. Another disadvantage of the diagram on the left is that it doesn't really show that this is a 3D structure. When we say that that strong electrostatic force of attraction is acting in all directions, we don't just mean up and down and left to right, we also mean forwards and backwards. However, there is a problem with the diagram on the right, which is that it's got these lines in between the ions, which kind of gives the impression that ionic bonds are physical structures you could reach out and touch, and that's not actually true. The ionic lattice is held together by this strong electrostatic force of attraction that is pulling the ions towards each other. It's not a physical bond that you could reach and grab and hold in your hand. Let's look at some typical exam questions. Why is it that ionic compounds are solids at room temperature? Well, as we've just said, their structure is that of a giant ionic lattice. And this is held together by a strong electrostatic force of attraction between oppositely charged ions. This is a phrase that is really worth you learning and just practicing until you can read it off pat, because on its own, this phrase can sometimes be worth three marks. One for naming the force, one for saying that it's really strong, and one for saying that it's between oppositely charged or positive and negative ions. Because that force is so strong, it requires a lot of energy to overcome it. And therefore, ionic substances have high melting points. And room temperature is lower than their high melting point, so therefore they remain solid. You could also be asked to explain why it is that solid ionic compounds like sodium chloride don't conduct electricity. In order to answer this, we need to consider what electricity actually is. Current is the flow or the movement of charged particles. Now, usually in physics, when we're talking about current, we're thinking about electrons moving, but electrons aren't the only charged particles. Ionic compounds are made of charged particles too, namely the ions. And this is one of the big mistakes that people make, particularly when we start thinking about current and electrolysis. We start talking about electrons moving, and we don't need to, because ions are charged particles too. Here's the problem, though. We've just said that current is the movement of charged particles. And although ionic compounds are made up of charged particles, if they're solid, the ions can't move. And this is because they're held together by that strong electrostatic force of attraction between oppositely charged ions. I've just explained why a solid ionic compound doesn't conduct electricity, but can you now pause the video and explain why a liquid ionic compound does? Pause the video and then we'll go through the answer. As we've just said, current is the movement of charged particles, and ionic compounds are made of charged particles, those positive and negative ions. When a substance is heated up until it melts, the strong electrostatic force of attraction is overcome by the energy, and that means that the ions are free to move. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you found that useful and are now confident describing and explaining the properties of ionic compounds. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE chemistry videos coming soon.